Proponents of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and let Leverage commonalities. Let's do away with political correctness. Explore ideation. Build community and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast. And this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. And I am delighted to be here with you guys today. It's your host, Bertine Premacore West. I'm delighted to have with me today our special guest, Forrest Tuff. He is what we will call a filmpreneur, and we're going to talk about that at some more in great detail. So, Forrest, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. So I'm going to tell our audience a little bit about you. So Forrest is a visionary leader and CEO of One Vision Productions, and that's an award-winning multimedia agency that specializes in corporate government video production, photography, drone services, and graphic design. His clientele ranges from small businesses to Fortune 100 companies and is a recipient of the Better Business Bureau Torch Award and named one of Atlanta's best and brightest companies to work for from 2015 to 2019. As an advocate for servant leadership, Forrest is a pro bono certified mentor with SCORE, business and industry advisory council member for Paul Duke STEM High School, and an ambassador for the American Heart Association. He received a leadership certificate from Broadsource and is a United Way VIP alumnus and FBI Citizens Academy graduate. He's armed with a desire to impact the community, and because of that, he created the Pay It Forward Initiative, which is an annually donated to a nonprofit organization. So in addition to that, Forrest was a 2018 nominee for the, now I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Turknet Leadership Character Award, which recognized outstanding leaders of character across the state of Georgia. He's been honored with the U.S. Attorney's Office Community Outreach Award, the Martin Luther King Drum Major for Service Award, and the President's Call to Service Award. So as if that wasn't enough, on the creative side, Forrest is an accomplished author, and his children's book, Things I Like 3D, has sold more than 7,000 copies independently and has been used in the DeKalb County school system. Under the pen name Horace Forrest, which is very catchy, um, Forrest was <laughs> nominated for the 46th Georgia Author of the Year Award by the Georgia Writers Association. So Forrest has produced, directed, and edited award-winning faith-based comedy and entertainment programs. So his cult classic music video, Swag Surfing, played at the White House and inspired A-list celebrities such as Beyonce, Chris Brown, and Lil Wayne. The video aired on BET and MTV and has 50, more than actually 50 million online views worldwide. He also produced The Mission, a Broadway-style musical stage play which premiered at the former 14th Street Playhouse, now called SCAD Show, um, to an audience that was standing room only on the main stage. So as we mentioned, Forrest is a filmpreneur. And so um, he has more than 100 film credits to his name, from a major motion picture with 20th Century Fox to indie films and a documentary with the US Department of Justice entitled Release. The award-winning documentary also received a $15,000 do- $15, donation from the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation. So as an empowerment speaker, Forrest shares his life experiences with the hope of motivating others to pursue their dreams. He connects to audiences by engaging them with enthusiasm and transparency. And in 2018, he was voted among the top 100 transformational leaders by John Maxwell team. The following year, he received the Toastmasters International um, designated Triple Crown Award and was recognized as the as their Division A Humorous Speech Winner and Outstanding Toastmaster of the Year. So Forrest has been featured in 
AMCP Blog, Business Leader Magazine, Core Magazine, Crossroads News, DeKalb Champion, Faith Flicks, Minority Biz Magazine, Voyage ATL, and Who's Who in Black Atlanta. He also received the Jabby Inc. International Trailblazer Award, Atlanta Business Journal's Georgia Minority Business Award, and was named the 2019 BE, a B, Modern Man of Distinction by Black Enterprise. So as if that wasn't enough, he's a former college basketball player at Gordon College and Western California University. And in 2012, he was inducted into the Gordon's Basketball Hall of Fame. So Forrest, how are you not exhausted? And congratulations on all of your accolades. Thank you very much. You know, we were talking off air about this, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the podcast. I just feel like you're such a great representation of really what diversity and inclusion actually means in the film industry. And, and I just couldn't Thank wait you. to have you share, you know, your experiences and, and your thoughts with our audience. So Okay, yeah, this is awesome. Oh, thank you. So let's just dive <laughs> right into it. So right. what does diversity and inclusion mean to you? For me... I look at diversity and inclusion this way, you know, it's, it's actually an opportunity for someone to get involved or engage in an industry sector or population where they're not represented. And whether that be your race, your gender, age, or even your spiritual belief, you know, you're given a fair opportunity to work in that environment. Now, there are a couple of things that I think are important in, in going with diversity and inclusion I think that also includes proper training on the co company culture as it stands. Also, some type of grace period to acclimate to that environment and also giving fair expectations and goals when you're thrust into an environment where you're not represented. So that's to me is a, a sense of what diversity and inclusion is. So can you expand upon, like, talk to me a little bit more about um, what, what would you consider a fair goal, just from your perspective? In terms of when you say a fair goal, in terms of being represented, in terms okay. of okay. what does that so, look like? So let's say if, I, if I'm a part of a company that reaches a certain population, and in that, I'm brought into the company, but yet I may not be a part of that culture. Well, I think a fair goal is to say, you know, hey, we have guidelines to reach this population. Let's just say it's a, if it's the Latino community, where I may not speak the language. So in that time period where I need to acclimate to what's happening and just understanding how the population is reached. I think there's a, a goal as opposed to being set high, like those who are used to this environment saying, Hey, here's a ramp of how we expect you to acclimate to this environment. So I think may, if, if I could summarize that, that would be maybe a ramp in expectations, not just a, Hey, you're at the same place. We want everybody to hit the same goals, but you know, acclimating to that culture also has something to do with having success in that within a company. Very, very true. And so what does that look like in the film industry? Because you gave us a good example with, you know, the Latino culture and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, expectations for them. But I, I'm even going to backtrack. When you first got into the film industry, what did it look like for you? Because I'm sure diversity and the thought of inclusion has changed along the way. Yeah, well, I can tell you on my personal my personal journey getting into the film industry, which has been around five or six years, mm -hmm. I was faced with the fact that I didn't have the background in film. So I jumped into an industry that I came in as a businessman. I saw the opportunity uh, come to Atlanta. So I came in as more of a business person, not somebody who had been immersed in the film industry from you know going to school, getting an education or having the network. So for me, it was interesting because just the learning curve to understand that industry was something that I had to take on first before I could actually get involved. So being a business owner, I had the equipment and everything to make the films, but I needed to understand the hierarchy of how that looked on a set, the terminology, you know, who are the people, what is the, what is the difference between above the line and below the line, which are terms used in the hierarchy of jobs on an actual set. So for me, it wasn't so much about getting into that industry, it was number one, just understanding that industry and joining organizations to get a better understanding so I could actually, you know, commute into that, into that industry. So it was a lot about doing your research first then, yeah? Yes, yes. So let's talk about the term filmpreneur. How'd that come about? Since you mentioned that you came to Atlanta as a businessman, how'd that all come about? Well, that's a marriage of the, of the two worlds that I see. There's the 
artist aspect of being a, a create a filmmaker. It's a creative side that deals more with the concept, the creation, how it moves people. And then there's also the business, the, the part that deals with how is this going to bring in revenue? What's going to be the bottom line? How are we going to pay people? How, how, how are we going to make this something that is sustainable to where we're not losing money? So I combine the two words, uh, film as a filmmaker, the creative and the entrepreneur, the business side. And that's where I came up with the term filmpreneur. It's a person who's proficient in the creative as well as the business side of filmmaking. I love that term. I really do. I must tell you. And I've never seen anyone else use it <laughs> even you. after you started using it. I'm like, that's so great. Like, because whenever I think of filmpreneur, your image pops into my head. Yeah. which I think is excellent marketing. <laughs> yeah, I am, I am working on solidifying that trademark as we speak now. I'm in the waiting process. So that's something that I really want to brand because it's an original concept for me. It's really fantastic. And I'm glad you're going to do that because every time I see the words filmpreneur, I'm like, okay, Forrest is involved in something, <laughs> right? And so I really love that. I think it's really important for people to, especially those who are creative. And and I am not particularly a creative person in that sense, yeah. but I, I used to be an interpreter, as you know, for um, a decade. And right. one of the things I realized was um, I didn't go to school for interpreting, um, mm -hmm. but I had to get my training and I had to learn about the field and I had to learn the terminology and the specializations. And so I had to I had to learn about the business side of it, which I, I saw kind of lacking. People want to pursue their passions. And that's why I share this part. People want to pursue their passions, but a lot of times um, in order to guarantee their success, they, they don't really realize that there's a whole business side to every industry that they need to become familiarized with. Right. That's right. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, Trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. You know, the, the interesting thing about, you know, these journeys, which are similar, like yours, you said, you know, hey, I didn't go to school. I didn't have any formal training either. Mm -hmm. But as a person who, one who loves research and who loves getting into, once you're passionate about something, that always drives you also mm -hmm. uh, to learn how to become more proficient and to become actually, you know, credible at what you do. That was a very important thing to be credible. So I find myself, you know, volunteering a lot of times with credible filmmakers. So people that were actually involved in the industry, I went to a site, it's called IMDB, the Internet Movie Database. And I found filmmakers that were in the industry that had great reputations. And a lot of, a lot of times they were actually working on independent projects. So in those independent projects, they may not necessarily have that $20 million budget. So their money is, is like, you know, most independent projects, you have to really budget the money. And I would come in and offer services that would be beneficial to the project. And so having the equipment and the expertise to service, let's say for an editor or a licensed drone pilot, I was able to get on the set experience and also make valuable connections, which would be integral in me becoming a filmmaker and you know i i love in that in that remark that you just made i love that you mentioned um being a drone pilot because when i first met you and i i thought to myself how does being a drone pilot relate to film and then i said <laughs> oh like once i got to know you and you told me a little bit more about your work i was like that makes perfect sense those yeah. are two things that i would have never put together and i yeah. thought that that you made that something that 
that was a commodity and that people needed and as a right. marketed as a service. And another thing that I loved was that, um, and I didn't know this at all, was that you volunteer to do a lot of stuff. And so this is um, where we have some similarities because for me, um, I always encourage people that I train to volunteer, right? And I did it myself. Right. And in the beginning, um, there were people that would say to me all the time, well, you're not getting paid for this. And I said, but I'm learning and I'm investing mm -hmm. myself in this way, right? right. And so um, at one point I, I told people that, you know, would ask me, because then it turned around and people say, well, how do I, how do I volunteer, right? Because then you serve as the, <laughs> right? Right. Because then they want to do it too, which is great. That's right. You have to tell them also, um, you know, volunteering requires also being proficient, right? That's right. And the ability to be humble and to learn. So I love that while you were doing all of these wonderful things, you were also volunteering because yeah. I think that's a great form of leadership, you know, not to lead from the front or from the back, but to lead from within. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's interesting about the volunteerism I'll share with people, when I worked with people or volunteer for the organizations, I I had a meeting with them and I asked them to treat me as if I was on their payroll, as if I was one of their highest paid employees. I said, I don't want slack. I don't want to be treated as if I'm doing you a favor. I want it. I want you to treat me as if you've hired me and uh, your money is riding on me doing my job, because that is the only way I could prepare myself for a high level job. If I got contracted by a major label, I needed to have that work ethic developed to know, okay, these are the deadlines. This is how, this is the terminology. This is how they work. And I would encourage anyone, if you're going to volunteer, do it as if this was your business. Don't do it as if you're doing someone a favor. Look at it as if they're giving you the opportunity of a lifetime and you'll get the most out of that volunteer relationship. Yes, and, that's a good, and that's a great way for people to recommend you because they know your work ethic. They say, hey, if this person will work like this for free. Imagine what they'll do if we pay them. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. And this is something as an aside um, that you also um, changed for me when, when I learned more about what you did. And I, I developed an appreciation for sitting for the movie credits. So <laughs> now, I won't lie, I used to only do that for Marvel because I'm a huge comic fan. And so I would just wait for, you know, the, the little bits and pieces that would come at the end of those films. But, but then once I met you and, and you were mentioning, you know, the different people that work, you know, to create a film, I, I couldn't go to the movies and not sit until the very end, you know? Right. And That's so right. now I'm like, all right, yeah, we're gonna watch the entire thing. And so I really, I really appreciate um, that contribution uh, because it really, it enlightened me about everyone, every single person whose name is on those credits. Um, because true. what they do brings an enormous amount of value to the things that we enjoy. And so I didn't wanna take that for granted. So I had to mention that um, in our interview because I wanted people to sit through <laughs> And watch all the credits. And the best part is, um, being that you and I live right here in ATL, the best mm -hmm. part is when I see that, you know, a film was made right here in Georgia, that's you know, right. and that's happening a lot lately. So I, I blame you for that for us. Now I spend a good <laughs> like 15 minutes in the movie theater. <laughs> and, and look, just to provide our listeners context, listen, that is market research. Okay, you want to know who's doing what. You're watching a film that's made in Atlanta. And if you watch the credits, there's going to be the actors and then there's going to be a ton of small businesses. Mm -hmm. All right, if you want to know where you can fit in, watch the credits. Look at, take notes on who are the people, who are the companies getting these opportunities. That may be something for you to know. Information is power. So yeah. to that point, that's what we're talking about. The fact that there's so much information in the credit rolls to give you leads on where you need to go or who you need to try to get get to in terms of making some opportunities for yourself. Absolutely, absolutely. And and that's a great thing because I, I don't think we realize that there's so much information around. I think yes, we know the internet is there, right? But we're not right. really going to know who to look for, you know, unless we do go to the movies and look at those credits, especially if it's for a film that we thought was particularly good, that's you right. know. Um, for me, when I look at film, because um, my background is in languages and linguistics and cultural mm -hmm. competency, when I look at movies, I, I look at the credits to see who did yeah, the subtitles, the closed captioning. Because for me, if I see that I feel like uh, a movie, uh, the person or the company, I should say, for closed captioning did their job so well when I don't even realize that I'm reading something. That's right. Right? That's and right. For 
that's when I'm thinking, well, who worked on that? And so then I sit through the credits and I watch it and I think, wow, that was amazing. You know, and other times I become that yeah. person in the theater that's, you know, if something is said incorrectly in a language that I happen to speak and understand, mm -hmm. I, I think, no, you know, what are they saying in there? But then, right. you know, I, I become that person. So don't be me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, you, you look at things with a critical eye. That's um, right you want them to be the best right you want them that's to be right. as they can be so i definitely love seeing who worked on closed captions and so going awesome. with friends become a, a challenging experience for them when they go with me but it's fun that's right <laughs> okay you know, it's and and the film industry from what i've learned the film industry from what i've learned is is a very people oriented business it's mm -hmm. really who you know so understanding who does what so let's say if you're watching this stuff and you get an opportunity to meet someone and you can say something that they know most general people won't understand, it leaves an impression. And like you say, everything is we have the Internet, but we sometimes forget that the human connection is still the most powerful way to impact people. And if you can find a way to do that in an industry that's really as closed in a sense, then you may have an opportunity to, to open some doors when that when that presents itself to you. Yes, indeed. It's all about relationship building, right? Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. So That's then right. when we're talking about your journey, um, tell me what were, because we talked about your accomplishments, mm -hmm. but what were some of the challenges besides okay. um, not knowing, you know, like not being classically trained in the film industry, I should say, right? Right. Um, right. Exactly right. Aspect, which was huge. Um, That's right. What were your challenges? Well, there were several, but I will tell you one that really, really, I had to deal with was learning the terminology on set. Mm. So when I'm working on set and I'm, you know, people are saying things and just not knowing huh, it's not registering and they're looking at me like, okay, do you know what you're doing? You know, that was a challenge. You know, I, I joined organizations like Georgia production partnership, which is one of the biggest influencers in Georgia to talk about that teaches you things that, that are happening in the film industry on all levels. And I'm at this meeting and I'm trying to get to know people and everybody's been in the industry some for years. It was a challenge just speaking their language because, you know, these aren't novice organizations. They're not made for people who just don't know, but they they accommodate you. But it was just really not knowing what the language was. So for me, it was immersing myself in organizations that dealt with the film industry and over time, you know, being patient to say, okay, over time, I'm going to pick this up. Over time, I'll get to know some people. And I think patience was probably the biggest challenge to get involved with, uh, with the industry. That might have been the biggest challenge that I had in this process. I can understand that for sure. Because when we're passionate about something, we want to just dive right into it, right? Yes, just jump right. in. Yeah, so we <laughs> can go. just do it. I'm like, I can do this. And That's then right. I'm thinking, oh, wait, but I don't know what they mean, <laughs> right? I, but I That's love right. Acknowledge that because I think it, it requires a great deal of humility um, to know what you don't know, right? Because I That's always right. tell people, I know what I know, but I absolutely definitely know what I don't know. That's because right. There's always still stuff to learn, right? That's right. Always. I love always. The organizations too because a lot of times people don't understand the value um, of joining organizations. Not only do you increase your your network, right? Um, That's right. But you increase your knowledge base and and really these are people that could potentially refer you potentially tell you about something else and it's professional development and investment in yourself mm -hmm. that's right there are a couple of organizations that are really important to know if you're going to be in the georgia film industry there's the georgia production partnership as i mentioned there's also something for creatives that is very interesting and we'll talk about this maybe we have the time it's from the um, Atlanta Mayor's Office of Film and Entertainment. It's, it's called a Creative Loan Fund from Invest Atlanta. And this is one of the first of its kind. It's actually a loan that's made, designed for creatives. And that's very rare for many of you who have applied for a loan and worked with uh, banks or the SBA or small businesses. You notice that it's really hard to get a loan for a creative concept. So that's something that's really big here um that's that's really revolutionary i think for film there's also the office uh the georgia department of economic development you know that's one of the state's leading agency for attracting new businesses uh georgia film and video uh digital entertainment source book it lists a lot of the professionals 
that are working in this uh, organization, and that's through Oz Publishing. There's Production Hub, and Production Hub just lists a global network of industry professionals that serve the film and industry uh, profession here in Atlanta. Thank you for sharing that, because I think um, it will be beneficial to a lot of our listeners, uh, particularly those that work in Atlanta or are thinking of coming to Atlanta, because we're, we're aptly, you know, crowned the Hollywood of the South. That's right. Finding that to be just another cherry on top of the cake, quite honestly. Yeah. Living oh, yeah. I mean, you know, there's so much happening in terms of work. I think... Georgia had a, a record 455 film and TV projects that resulted in about $9.5 billion in economic impact. And, and how that translates is the film industry here in Georgia, film and TV industry is responsible for about 92,000 jobs. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's at $2.7 billion in wages, uh, you know, affecting roughly 30,000 Georgians. So they're creating jobs and feeding families. So that is a major impact uh, in Georgia, just on this industry. Yes, indeed. Yes, yeah. indeed. And for our listeners, uh, he said billions with a B. Billions, like, yes. Billions. <laughs> billions. So I want them to really get, you know, the impact of what, what it means to work in the film industry here in Georgia. Yeah. Now we talked about the industry a little bit, and we'll get back to a couple more things about it. But in 2015, people of color purchased 45% of all movie tickets sold in the U.S., and Mm -hmm. yet they remained underrepresented on both the large and the small screens. How can you explain this dichotomy? What's the reason for this contrast, do you think? Well, I think we first, I think as, as people in general, we have to understand who are the key players in making the film industry happen. And, you know, the film industry has been around for a while, and it's, it's mainly a white male dominated industry. Now, you also have to recognize for those who understand investment, a lot of times people invest in things that they understand or they know that they can get a return in. So the representation of film does not reflect the minority community because the majority of investors are not minorities. So I think what we've seen is films that we've as as different minorities have just uh, uh, acclimated ourselves to and then we also have to understand when we're talking about making investments we also also have to look at bottom line this year 2000 in 2018 we've seen that a, a majority minority cast with the film black panther not not black panther yeah black panther, yeah, black panther. you know and, what about that <laughs> yeah and also what is the what is the the film that was more of, of an Asian culture film. Oh, yes. Um, oh, my goodness. It's on the tip. It's going to come to me. It's going to come to me. But that, that this, these films have generated hundreds of millions, even billions of dollars. Yes. Now, at the end of the day, that's what really matters in investment. Mm-hmm. It's what brings us the return. And now that they've seen that movies with minority cast can actually bring in a return, I think we're going to see more of that. So I think right now we're not seeing as much of it because it hasn't been displayed. Right. And so, Just so I I'm sorry. There, the, the movie was Crazy Rich Asians. Crazy Rich Asians. That's yeah. it. Yes. Black, Black Panther and Crazy Rich Asians. That's right. Uh, I was so delighted because with regard to Crazy Rich Asians, there hasn't been that kind of buzz about a movie since Joy Luck Club. And I That's remember- right watching Joy Luck Club and thinking, wow, this is so beautiful that um, American, this is a part of American culture, that Asian culture is being included in this way. Yeah, the, as a Hollywood feature, you really get to see the diversity in the movie. And that's the thing about it. What I love is the movies are showing the diversity amongst individual racial groups. So let's say if, if it's an Asian culture, you see there's diversity even in the Asian culture, how people are different. And characters are relatable to say hey i know someone like that that's in my family that has that type of maybe humor or they're just a little you know high strung so i think it's great that you get to see the diversity of cultures in these films and i think that's very important absolutely and i'm glad that you mentioned diversity within diversity because that's a huge thing for me and i love speaking to people about it um because when people are saying to me well you know, or if I hear, um, if I'm watching television or, you know, someone speaking and they're talking about the black community, I'm right. like, well, that's not a monolithic thing, right? right. Just the Asian community and, and the Latin community. Um, you have not only, you know, 
diversity within that, but you also have people who are um, biracial, multiracial, you know, multicultural, bicultural, that right. can seamlessly move from one to the other. So, you know, their experience by sheer virtue of being um, bi or multiracial or multicultural, um, that's going to make their experience different, right? That's right. That's exactly so, right. You know, I identify myself as somebody who is black, yes, but who is also Caribbean and Latin, you know, mm -hmm. and so I, I'm able to do that. So my black experience might be different from, you know, another friend's black experience who is African American or somebody that is from Ethiopia or somebody that is from Senegal. So That's right. you know, I, I love it when people talk about that because I think it's really important that people see that like there's there's diversity within diversity and there's beauty within mm -hmm. all of it. Mm -hmm. and, and that just goes back to the question you asked about what we do as a culture. A lot of times, even though we're so diverse, we generally gravitate to the movies that, that we can maybe relate to. Sure. Like let's say you're, you know, you have a Caribbean culture, but you may see a movie that says, well, I can relate to that black experience okay. or someone that's Latino can say, I can relate to maybe that black experience or that Latino experience. And those are some of the movies that we gravitate to. And I think what's happening now, I think for entertainment purposes, you know, there's a lot that goes. One thing that Hollywood is really great at is they make movies that are necessary for the culture as a whole, because we can't forget that this is entertainment. It's yeah. real life, but the entertainment factor is what we need. I mean, when there's war, the superhero genre just took off because, hey, we want to be saved, right? We want to be saved. We need a hero to save the day. Yeah. Everybody so <laughs> Everyone can relate to that. So I think in, in as we continue to make movies, even as we get more, we get more diverse cultures, even at top of the line, you know, producer, executive producer, director, I think we also have to stay mindful that this is the business of entertainment. So yeah. it is the business of making movies. Yes, it's bottom line. But we have to also understand that there is a culture of creating something that transcends cultures. And that is what makes the movie business such a such a great thing, I believe. I love that, Forrest. That there's a culture of making movies that transcends cultures. I love that. That right. that's another Forrest original, you all. So <laughs> you're gonna have to trademark that one too. <laughs> TM. <laughs> you might have answered this to an extent. So why does the idea of having one story told as a woman, a person of color, a lesbian, a trans person, or any member of any disenfranchised or underrepresented you know, group or community. Um, how, why is that such a radical thing to do still? Like, why is that um, so shocking? I, and I was talking to somebody the other day, mm -hmm. um, we were talking about how sometimes when, when we walk into the room, we might be the only person that looks like we look, right? And we both That's look right. very That's different, um, this right. friend that I was talking to, but I might be the only person that looks like I look. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, somebody might say, because I've heard this in the past growing up, oh, wow, you look so exotic. And I'm right. like, I'm not exotic. There are billions <laughs> of people that literally look just like me, right? right. Um, so, and I think the idea of that, uh, and, and, you know, sometimes it's given as a compliment because the person doesn't, doesn't sometimes think about the greater context of that, right? People that look like me or that look like anybody that's the only one in the room, right? Whatever that might look like, um, they're if other people saw more of people that look like people that don't look like themselves, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? That's um, right. If you've got blonde hair and blue eyes and you're in a room full of brunettes um, or redheads, you're going to be the exotic one, right? right. So right. how do we get people to, to see that, you know, there's no one that's really exotic. It's exposure, right? right. It's our lack of exposure. So I guess this brings me back to that question. Why is making a movie, about people that look, you know, any particular way or people that, that you know, have any particular um, orientation or people mm -hmm. that just come from any place um, that might be deemed different from the standard that we tend to see in the movies. Why is it so radical? Well, you know, the thing is, there's still prejudices. And I think that's just one of the things that exists. It just exists. Prejudice ex exists. And so does, like like you say, the concept of people just not having exposure okay. and a lot of times not having that exposure can help develop that bias or this stereotype of what a person is you know and the, the truth is stereotypes are created for a reason some of it is partly true and some of it is exaggerated to a point but if you don't have the part 
truth of it, you just have the exaggerated stereotype. And that is why people have this stigma or they can't get around changes. There are a lot of changes that have been happening in this era over the past decade. You know, mm-hmm. non-traditional homes, you know, non-traditional relationships. Uh, people are still, you know, dealing with religious beliefs. They're dealing with social norms, how they were raised. And a lot of times that goes into how people can see something or how they can respond to it or what they feel about it just from a general sense of what they know. So what's happening is with all these changes, you're starting to get more representation really at an independent level on things that you want to see. So if, if let's say if the LGBT community wants to make a film, then there's a film on their film festivals that now cater to the community. Mm-hmm. Now, if you want to have something that's told from a woman, you now have women organizations that are like, hey, we're here for the empowerment of women. So what you're having is you're having the communities that are disenfranchised, they're actually coming together to create their voice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so they're going to they're gonna be the ones that change these radical concepts, the way people see them, because they have to be their own advocates. And I think over time, that's going to have an impact on the culture because you have companies now having more div- uh, strict diverse, diversity and inclusion practices. You have things happening within the film industry. You have things happening within the jobs. And I think over time, that particular way of going about it will actually have an impact to where it won't seem so radical. But I think we're just at that phase where people are now getting adjust to it or it's actually out in the open. It's not something that's being that's in the quiet. And that is a very good thing, I think, that it's out in the open. Yeah. Um, and, and I think also too, um I I was mentioning to somebody about this once that um we were talking about the civil rights movement, mm-hmm. right? And I thought there was this iconic picture um, of Dr. King walking with with people of different races, different religions, and they were locked arm in arm. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I think of that particular picture, it reminds me of the power of allyship, right? Wow, yeah. The power of supporting someone that's that's other than you, that's different from who and and what you are and what your ideals and beliefs might be. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly for the LGBTQ community, um, particularly for women, particularly, you know, for any disenfranchised community, um, you know, one, for example, would be indigenous language speakers. There there are indigenous language filmmakers out there. And so, you know, how come we don't see so many of them? And I think it's a, it's a, it's not that they don't exist, right? Because we know they're out there, but I think it's the power of allyship. And, you know, by, by women and, and trans people and any particular group coming and doing things on their own, I think that's amazing for representation. But right. I also think that it behooves us to support people um, and companies that are different from us, that's right? right. That's, that's the right. way that we're going to level the playing field for everyone. Mm-hmm. There are two filmmakers that I, I partner on films uh, on, on several occasions, and there's two particular filmmakers that I work with. One filmmaker, I uh, co-produced this film. Uh, her name is Shadalina Palmer. And we worked on a film for the Easter Seals Disability Challenge. Mm-hmm. And that's that deals with autism awareness. Mm, okay, you know that's right. near, near and dear to my heart. Right, that's near and dear. And so the one thing that was great about working on these projects, this is our second year, is the goal is to showcase actors, people in the industry that may be on the autism spectrum but they're, they're cast in roles that they're meant for. So as opposed to casting someone who isn't on the autism spectrum as a person that's on the autism spectrum, you actually cast someone that is. That's yeah. an actor. That's a trained professional. So it's a great way of getting, getting this out. And also there are little people that work on the films because this is another thing of making sure that there's representation for different people not just ethnicities and races but people that deal with different someone coined this and i thought it was great different abilities or we call it disabilities they call it a different ability that they're actually professionals that work so cast them give them the opportunity of first right of a refusal when that actual position comes up in the film and so that's what inclusion really looks like that's what 
definitely looks like. So I, I love that people have the opportunity to be professionals in their field and, and they bring their true life experience and abilities to any production. And I think that adds sure. so much more value, not only to the final product, but the team that assembled that final product, you know? Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And I was, I was mentioning the other gentleman I work with, Ku Diggs, we worked on a film called Jackpot and it dealt with two women that had lived that were homeless. Mm -hmm. And actually one of the actors, actors had actually been in that position before. Wow. So what she brought to it was a raw reality that, you know, you can get from, you know, method acting or even from, you know, having a consultant, but this was a true experience that resonated with her. So it's just things like that that we're trying to do. And even as an independent filmmaker, or producer to work on different projects, but actually cast in that. And I think a lot of that starts in the independent industry also. I mean, we look to Hollywood, but I think the things that we want, we have to be the change that we want to see in the industry also. Absolutely. That, that's a play on what Gandhi said, right? Be the change you want to see in the world. Be the change. Exactly. Excellent. Excellent. So then this brings me to my next question. How have hiring practices changed since you first started making films? Like your particular hiring practices, what's different, if anything? Well, for me, I definitely like to work with interns and train them. So I offer, because we don't oftentimes have the budgets or the investors in independent projects, a lot of times you have to train people that you need, you give them opportunities, and you also work with other, other filmmakers that you've worked with on different projects, and then you have your budget for actors or, or you know, cinematographers or things of that nature. So for me, the hiring practices have been consistent in my experience. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as Hollywood and the Hollywood experience, I'm not quite sure on that, how that's changed for women or males or anything of that nature. But for me, it's more about, number one, a skill set. What is the benefit that we can provide each other if, there's, if we're doing a barter? Because I believe in bartering system in this particular industry. Sure. Because it's a creative industry, there, there is, it's a different way of, of being able to complete projects. So for me, it's been pretty consistent. You know, there's the bartering, there's also the pay, but there's also the training and giving you on the job experience that can be used for you to actually secure jobs later on. Which I think is a wonderful thing to do. I think it's a great investment um, in the next generation of filmmakers right? and, and, and film executives, quite honestly. Um, I recall right. when you had... Uh, an event uh, where I was speaking on diversity in the film industry, you had your intern with you. And I thought that was so awesome <laughs> to see this young man just walking around and he was literally soaking up the room. You could feel it. It was palpable. And, and right. he was just, I thought, what an education for him. What a fantastic education. And what a great way for him to contribute to his own self-development. Right? That's his right. Exactly. So I thought that was amazing. Yeah, um, thank so you. This brings me to our last question for us. Where do you see the film industry with regard to diversity and inclusion within the next 10 years? Because a lot's happened in the last 10 years. So where do you see things going in the next decade? I think there's going to be an influx of changes, meaning there's going to be more diversity on the big screen. And I think that stems from the fact that the money was made from Black Panther and Crazy Rich Asians. And I, I always stem changes when it comes to business or industries are synonymous with revenue. You know, I'd like to say, Oh, it's great. Everyone's going to feel better. There's going to be a great kumbaya moment and they're just going to make, you know, these diverse films. But at the bottom line is there's money being made and they recognize that, Hey, there are people, the consumers will buy to see representation of themselves on film Absolutely. or the representation of others. And I think that's going to be the change within the next 10 years. They're going to see that, people are buying and they're consuming content and it's going to force it along with changes that are happening. There are different organizations that are, you know, fighting for rights. And I'm not, I won't, you know, say that that's not important. That's huge. That's going to be huge what these organizations are doing, but I think it's going to be driven by the bottom line, the money. And I think there's going to be a big change. I'm inclined to agree with you. I'm inclined to agree with you. <laughs> Boris, thank you so much for being on this episode. I so love having you. you on the Global Fluency Podcast. So tell our listeners what you're up to next, where they can find you. Okay. 
Well, I am currently doing a training at your Global Fluency Conference on okay. September 21st. So I'll be teaching the diversity and inclusion in the film industry. So please, by all means, come out. You can have that information. But you can find me at forresttuff.com. That's F-O-R-R-E-S-T. T-U-F-F dot com. Forrestuff dot com. That will lead you to all my social media sites. Everything is there. But if you can remember one place, go to Forrestuff dot com and that'll get you to anything that I'm doing as it relates to public speaking, business, philanthropy, or definitely the film industry. Excellent. Excellent. So Forrest, once again, on behalf of the Global Fluency Podcast and a personal thank you as well, I want to tell you thanks so much for being on the show. I know this is going to be a great episode to, you know, promote the conversation of diversity and inclusion in the film industry. So to our listeners out there, how are you going to keep the conversation going? Listen to this episode, share it with your friends, um, send us your comments, let us know what you think. So Thanks so much for us. It's been great having you on the show. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right, everyone. Let's keep the conversation going. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences, leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going, going.